as the name implies, this is very much about how food affects our mental health because what we're much use, more used to hearing about is how food causes chronic diseases like heart disease, strokes, different types of cancers and so on and so forth. But what is not talked about so much is why a whole food vegan diet is so exceptionally good for us to thrive in terms of mental health. So what this talk is not, it's not about serious mental diseases. And obviously, I totally recognise that there are other things that impact on mental health. You know, if your marriage is breaking down, if you hate your job and so on, then obviously that's going to have a big impact on how you feel about yourself and your life. But what is often not talked about is supposing your life is fine, it's going well, um, it's at least normal in your view, but you feel more irritable than you think you should, perhaps you feel anxiety, perhaps you cry a lot, um, perhaps you feel excessive tiredness, perhaps there are things, or your memory is not as good as it was. Maybe there's some component that you're not thinking about in terms of getting back to good mental health and that component could well be your diet. And that's what today's talk is about, mood food. So I hope you get something out of this. Very quickly, I've given you out a guide, um, Nutrition in a Nutshell. Please don't look at it because you can, obviously, at your leisure for the rest of your lives. <laughs> but there's um, a chart in there which is what you should eat for good health because a lot of what we talk about is what we shouldn't do, but I think more importantly, really, is what we should be doing for optimal health. So for optimum mental health, if you look in that Nutrition in a Nutshell guide, there's this chart which tells you the foods that you thrive on and obviously I'll hopefully explain a little bit about why. So we're talking about for women eight portions of fruit and veg a day, for men even more nine to ten. How many of you get what the government says the five a day? Be honest just fruit and veg I'm talking about every single day now fresh fruit and veg. How many of you manage to reach the five? Yeah so it's not very many of you actually is it? Um, and that's not, the average intake of fruit and vegetables in the UK today is three. And that's pretty poor when you think we're supposed to be eating eight to ten every day. And we wonder why we struggle and why we don't feel as good as we should be doing. Um, the other thing that is the mainstay of energy levels, actually, it's not things like meat with protein in it which I hear a lot, um, it's the cereals and grains group, it's the whole grain group. So it's very important that it's brown bread, not white. It's very important it's brown rice, not white. And it's very important it's whole grain, you know, spaghetti, etc., and not the white variety. Um, because it's the whole grain versions that retain all the nutrients that are so essential for your health. And things like the fibre that's retained in the whole grain variety is what slows down the release of the glucose, for example, that's in it, you know, from the starches. Really important for maintaining good mental health. So we need quite a considerable amount a day, don't we? Three to four portions every single day. That's what our body likes for fuel, okay, and our brain. Then we need two or so portions of the pulses. So that by that, I mean any peas, beans and lentils, and it can be Heinz baked beans, I don't care, just eat more beans. How many of you eat beans, peas or lentils every single day? Well done you. The rest of you, something really easy you can aim at now, isn't it? Um, vegetable oils. We only need small amounts of oils, we don't need any saturated fats because we make them ourselves. Um, and they're known as the bad fats. They're the ones that raise your bad cholesterol levels, but what we do need are the so-called good fats, and flaxseed oil is the best source for us by a long way, just because it's got such a high ratio of omega-3 in it. So I'll come on to that later on. And then we need a source of B12 as well. And water. <laughs> and just before I really get going, I just wanted to reassure you, there has been a study showing vegans get plenty. Very important study, a large one, because you look at the numbers there, 65,000 or so people, a lot of people, and they compared vegetarians, meat eaters, fish eaters, and vegans. And they looked at their nutrient status. So this is something that cannot be argued with. People try and argue about this all the time. Everybody's got a view on food, haven't they? And everybody thinks they're a nutritionist. But in fact, there are certain things that just cannot be argued with, and this is a certain measure of nutrients. And vegans had higher all of these things, including 
iron. <laughs> so there was a study done, a big study again, 37,000 people, and they were asked about how they felt about themselves. And over four-fifths said they became impatient too quickly. Most people think their energy levels aren't what they should be. Most people think they've got too much to do. And again, most people think they become anxious or tense easily. So just let me ask in the audience, how many of you think your energy levels aren't what they should be on a daily basis, you know, every day? Yeah, so that's... You don't have to be shy. <laughs> that's most of you. So that's normal. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be normal, but it is normal. How many of you think you become impatient too quickly, don't have the tolerance you think you should have? It's harder to admit to those things in public, isn't it? <laughs> OK. So how do we stay sane then? Do, do, do we get advice on our diet? Does the government say, OK, well, a whole food vegan diet, folks, this is what you need, and you know you could be feeling a lot better. Or does it support the pharmaceutical industry? You guess. So how do we cope? How do we cope? Yeah. Well, the United Kingdom pops over 500 million tranquilizers coming up for 500 million sleeping pills, over 800 million antidepressants. But also, we self-prescribe, I would say, about 6 million kilos of sugar a week to ourselves, 1.5 billion caffeinated drinks a week. We smoke 1.5 billion cigarettes. We drink 102 million alcoholic drinks. And we smoke about 10 million cannabis joints a week in the UK. Something that's just not mentioned anywhere near enough, as I said, is food. What does food do to us? Because it is a cliché, you are what you eat. It doesn't just impact on whether you get clogged up arteries or clogged up artery that's feeding your brain. It doesn't just impact on the growth of cancers around different body sites. It impacts on how our brain functions because it can only do so much. You know, you are just a mass of chemicals, basically, and those chemicals are made from the nutrients that you consume. So it can only do what it can do with what you give it. And there was a study, and there are so many studies of this, so I'm not going to go through them all, but just as an example, a typical example where depressed patients, so these are, you know, properly depressed people, if you like, not something that's going to lift in a short while. Um, they split the group into those given um, antidepressants and those given what's called 5-HTP, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But basically, it's made, you manufacture it from an amino acid you eat that's in all sorts of food called tryptophan. And it goes on to make the happy hormone, serotonin, in your brain. That's the one that gives you good mood, good feeling, happy feeling. So they give one group the, um, something that we make naturally ourselves and the other group the antidepressant drugs. And they found that the 5-HTP <coughs> outperformed the antidepressant on every single measure, improving depression, anxiety, insomnia, and importantly, no side effects. And we all know antidepressants have side effects. I know lo lots of people on antidepressants, um, people you'd never guess in a million years are on antidepressants. And what they all say is that they're addictive. They're very clearly addictive. And that's just one more study, which was given middle-aged people either vitamin B9 or a dummy pill over three years. And those taking the folic acid improve their memory by about 5.5 years um, younger equivalent. And this is just to give you an idea that there are lots of these studies going on, but um, we're not really, it doesn't really make its way to the public. And that's also very interesting because there have been a few of these studies now, um, really important studies. I remember one that was done on juveniles um, in a juvenile prison, and they split them into the typical prison diet that they were having and given a whole food diet which was generally very healthy and they found that the aggression reduced really markedly and those put on a good diet and then after the study they just went back to giving them all what they always had and that's what I found really remarkable is like we know these things are true and yet they just don't translate into um, government policy. And finally there was a study that was published on Valentine's Day this year which was about going vegetarian improves your mood. And it was a nice little study. It was only um, two weeks. So obviously, my view is that it just sort of gives you a taster for um, what is real and that more um, research should be done in this area. But basically, they split 
a group of meat, eat meat eaters um, and split them into three groups, those eating meat and fish, those eating no meat but fish, and then the rest they asked to go vegetarian for the period of this study. And they measured their mood by profile questionnaires um, and by depression, anxiety and stress scales, which are a, a common way of measuring how people feel about themselves. And basically, the output was that only those that went vegetarian improved their mood significantly within that period of time. What surprised the scientists, because they didn't particularly expect the meat and fish eaters to improve their mood, but what they did expect was those that got rid of the meat and only ate fish to improve their mood. How many of you keep hearing about that you've got to eat fish, you've got to eat fish, you've got to eat fish? Um, you know, it's almost like a mantra. Um, and in fact, it surprised them that, in fact, those that ate no fish were the ones whose moods became much more buoyant. Um, it's not known why. I mean, they don't, you know, you, they don't precisely know why. What the theory is, is that the vegetarian diet was significantly higher in antioxidant vitamins, so that's beta carotene, C and E, coming from the plant kingdom, of course, um, which protects your brain. And that not the quantity of omega-3, that's the good fat, one of the good fats, but the ratio of the, the amount of fats that the vegetarians eat, so they say it's what's important. And I've heard this more and more and more and more, um, that it's the ratio that really matters more than the quantity. And I'll come on to that later. So what are the five essential booster foods for your brain? They are the protein group. Amino acids are the building blocks for protein. Glucose, you all know that's sugar. That's the main fuel. This is what your brain really wants to work off. That's its main preference as a fuel is glucose. Um, EFAs means essential fatty acids, so that's omega-3 and 6. They're the good fats. Phospholipids are a type of fat. And the so-called intelligent nutrients that are, are like backing everything up are the vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. And of course, you only get vitamins in diet. You don't make them yourselves internally. So every day we have an average of 6,000 thoughts, which are like electrical ripples going across the brain. That sounds incredibly um, Einstein, doesn't it? But sadly, most of them are repeats. <laughs> so we're not being original every time. And I just find this so mind-blowing in itself every time I think about the brain. Our brains have got 100 billion nerve cells in them. I mean, how does it all get in there? Do you remember when you did biology GCSE or O-level when you were taught about one nerve cell meeting one other nerve cell and about the gap in between called the synapse and this electrical signal passes down them? Well, in reality, imagine you've got 100 billion nerve cells inside your brain. It's not one connecting to one. It's literally thousands connecting to thousands. How on earth don't we go wrong more often? I mean, we are phenomenally, brilliantly beautiful. Every animal on this planet is. We're just amazing. And I think our brains deserve a little more care from what we actually put into our bodies, don't you? So those nerves talk to each other. As I said, there's a gap that's called a synapse. Now, you get the sending station, if you like, at the end of one nerve cell. It sends out a messenger, and that messenger is called a neurotransmitter but it's, it's basically the message. And that message is different according to what amino acids it's made up of. So all those neurotransmitters or messengers are all made from protein. So this is why amino acids are so vital to your diet. And the most common shortage in terms of neurotransmitters in the brain is serotonin. And that's the one that makes you feel happy. So also, you've got the sending station, which sends out the message, and you've got a receiving station, which is called a receptor, and they're very specific. It's like, I used to think the way it used to be taught was that you had this chemical that was released, and it locked into a hole that fit it, so it's like a key in a lock. And it's true that that key, the neurotransmitter and the receptor that receives it on the other nerve cell, they only fit one another. OK? But actually, it's much more fluid than that. It's true that they only fit one another, but they dance, and it's beautiful. They actually go in and out, in and out, in this most beautiful dance. And, oh, see, I, I find it fascinating anyway. <laughs> this is just kind of the mind-blowing sort of proportions of everything, which, you know, is quite hard to get to grips with, how everything happens on such a microscopic scale. 
so there we've got, as I've just said, you've got your brain, you've got these different nerve cells with the synapses, which are the gaps between the nerve cells. So you've got your message here coming out from one nerve cell, which fits onto the receptors on the other nerve cell, and it sends an electrical impulse down that nerve cell, and you interpret it according to what that amino acid is made of. And the actual receptors, so these are the ones receiving the messengers, these sit on a bed here of the phospholipids and the essential fatty acids. So these are essential. You're replenishing them all the time, all the way through your life. So I'm just showing you this, just so you're starting to get um, a feeling for how important your diet is, just to compose the brain itself, the actual structure of it. This sounds very chemical, and I don't get more chemical than this, don't worry. I just wanted to show you two things about why diet was really important. This is called the catecholamine pathway. So this is really important. Uh, all of you have heard of the drug ecstasy. They just did a program. Did any of you see the documentary uh, this week and last week where they did uh, trials with people taking ecstasy and actually looking at what it does to the brain? And it affects the dopamine pathway of the brain. Now, dopamine is your motivator. It what, it's what makes you feel good again, but also it motivates you to do the things that you want to achieve. And adrenaline, you've all heard of adrenaline, of course, it's also a neurotransmitter in your brain. And adrenaline, again, is very much a motivating neurotransmitter. Um, it's what really gets you going, it's what gets you out of bed in the morning, you know? So it goes with the sort of feel-good factor and very, very, very important neurotransmitters. So we're starting this whole pathway, though, which is fairly complicated, really, to get from that to that every time, with this amino acid, which is in your food, called phenylalanine. And what I really wanted to show you, just as much as it has to go through all this, was all these nutrients that it takes for it to convert from one to another. So folic acid is B9. Folic is the key, means it's from foliage. B9 very high in a vegan diet. Magnesium is central to chlorophyll in plants. It's like the central um, substance, like iron is for us in our blood cells. It's magnesium for plants. So very rich in a vegan diet. Manganese, iron, copper, zinc, vitamin C, all plentiful on a whole food, not a junk, vegan diet. Tyrosine, again, look at all the nutrients that you need to come through. So this is why it simply isn't good enough not to have a good diet, to be able to make the, the amount of neurotransmitters you need to feel happy, motivated, and all the rest of it, presuming everything else in your life is, you know, going okay. And notice vitamin B12, by the way, gets noradrenaline from adrenaline, so it's one of the key functions of B12 that you don't really hear about very often. And this is the serotonin pathway. Most of you have probably heard of serotonin because it's the one, like I said, it's known as the happy hormone. It's actually a neurotransmitter, a messenger. And don't you find it astounding that a chemical can make you feel happy? <laughs> anyway, so we're coming from an amino acid, L-tryptophan, which is in loads of vegan foods, as is the other one, phenylalanine. I'll come on to that later, but they're very easy to find in a vegan diet. Again, B9 and vitamin C takes you to 5-HTP, which I was talking about before, where they did the trials against the antidepressants and found this worked better. You can get this in health food shops, by the way. You need three substances here to get to your serotonin, so a relatively short pathway. And then serotonin, make, who's heard of melatonin? Quite a few of you. This is responsible for your sleep-wake cycle. Again, you can get this in health shops and... The only time I really recommend it, one of the times, is if you know you're going to get jet lag, say you're flying to Australia. It can be very helpful indeed. But serotonin is crucial because it makes melatonin for your sleeping well. So you can see how diet is absolutely essential because the tryptophan is coming from what, you, you know, what you're eating. So there's a little summary there. Raw materials are these amino acids, and they're the messengers or the neurotransmitters that they're making, so tryptophan to serotonin and melatonin, and so on. And there's the functions in the mood, which I suspect is what you're all interested in, <laughs> is why does all this matter? Well, it matters, doesn't it? Because all these things are exceptionally important. You just think you're short in something like acetylcholine, that's absolutely vital for memory. 
So it's really important that we have the substances that can make this um, neurotransmitter. Um, so adrenaline, the motivation, helps you deal with stress. So that's obviously really important. Um, dopamine, motivator, alertness, etc. Serotonin we've mentioned, and so on and so forth. GABA, I'll come on to later. It's, I find GABA really, really interesting because that actually switches adrenaline off, and that sometimes is a very important thing to do. It's the chill neurotransmitter. So amino acids. What, what would give you a clue that you're not actually eating enough protein in your diet then? These, this list here, depression, apathy, not motivated, can't relax very well, so you're not switching out very well, your memory's not what you think it should be, and you're not concentrating as well. And th this is fairly common. Um, it's very easy, though, to get enough protein on a good vegan diet, very easy indeed. And the easiest way, one of the easiest ways to boost protein on a vegan diet, or a vegetarian diet, or for anybody for that matter, healthily, is to what, do what I said at the start, which is increase the number of pulses that you have every day. So start thinking, like people from Turkey, etc., do naturally, is use the peas, beans, lentils group in your cooking. So if you're making a vegetable curry, just shove a, a, kin, a tin of um, whatever beans, could be kidney beans, whatever, doesn't matter, whatever you enjoy. Just think about adding it. If you make tomato soup, even if it's you know, like a tin of tomato soup, open a tin of beans and put some in with it. So all the time, salad, think about you know, buying the three beans. Again, canned beans are fine, as long as you just don't buy the salted ones. So just add some beans onto the salad. So just start thinking in those ways. And for breakfast, which is crucial, do something like add flaxseed, ground flaxseed, because that's the seed, very high in protein. All seeds, high in protein. So when you think about protein, and you're thinking, I can't remember what she said, where do you get protein from? Just think, the start of life of the plant is always rich in protein. So all the pulses, which I've just said, they're the start of the life of the plant, aren't they? The pea, the bean, whatever. So the nuts and the seeds, also the start of the life for a plant, but all of them are very high in protein. Okay, so that's what you need to be eating. So snack on unsalted nuts, about that many a day. So you like your palm. Um, exceptionally good for you. So there are eight or nine essential amino acids. And by essential, what that means is that you don't manufacture them inside yourself. So you have to get them from the foods that you're eating. Um, so tryptophan that makes serotonin, you will all be interested in that. And so we should be, because um, it's the most common deficiency, actually. But again, on a good vegan diet, I mean, you have to be eating real rubbish not to be able to get enough of this. And of course, in Britain, we do eat a lot of real rubbish. But if you're a good vegetarian or vegan, you should be eating lots of brown rice, lots of different types of nuts, unsalted, and lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. And they're, you, know, you will not be short of tryptophan. Um, phenylalanine, which makes the um, dopamine and adrenaline. Well, again, I mean, the beautiful food groups, I love this because it's bananas, avocados, almonds, sesame seeds, soya, so soya milk, tofu, edamame, oats. And think of all the things that you can do with that. Whole wheats, I mean, you know, this is not difficult on a good vegan diet. So there's just a couple of examples of what to do to increase your um, protein levels, which is adding heaped seeds and nuts to, for example, an oat-based porridge. Um, adding tofu to your stir fry, using quinoa. Do you all know what quinoa is? Yeah. So you can buy that now in the supermarkets, for those of you that don't know, and use it like you would brown rice. And it's very quick to cook, and it's in practically every supermarket now. Um, that's this word here, quinoa. Uh, very, very high in protein, and it's got all essential amino acids in it, quinoa. I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's got eight essential amino acids, as has soya. And amaranth is another one that's got them too. So you don't need to eat them, though. You don't need to worry about getting all amino acids in one food. It's a complete and utter myth, that, which kind of came about in the early 70s. Um, it's quite a damaging myth, really, because it's one of the reasons people have said that eating meat is better for protein than eating vegan foods, and it's absolute rubbish. Um, it really is. We store a pool of amino acids in our bodies, and you add to that pool, and you take from it what you need. So as long as you're eating a variety of foods every day, you do not need to worry about, oh, I must have all eight or nine essential amino acids in one hit. 
So the good sources of lots, most plants have got almost all the amino acids in them, by the way, but they've got varying amounts. So the good sources of what I've just said, but also brown rice, um, all the pulses, I've said all that, the nuts and the seeds. Corn on the cob, for those of you that like that, I, I love that. Um, um, broccoli, cauliflower and spinach as well from the vegetable groups. You know, the, the, these things are all excellent foods. Can you eat too much protein? Absolutely. Um, very much linked to chronic disease in the West, but it's animal protein. There haven't been any studies showing any damage from vegetable, and I find that really fascinating. Why is that? Because we're a human being, and if you come to my next talk, wheat eaters or meat eaters, I'll explain all about that. But animal protein is linked to um, heart disease, very much so, even more than saturated fat, in terms of raising bad cholesterol. Um, it's linked to cancers. It's linked to kidney damage and so forth. So eating too much animal protein is definitely very damaging. It's also when you eat lots of meat and dairy, because your blood has to be at a slightly alkaline pH, very slightly, just over neutral, everything that you eat forms ac is acid or alkaline forming after you've eaten it in the blood. Um, and what causes your blood to become more acidic, more than anything, is meat and dairy, because... The amino acids, the proteins, are, contain a lot of sulfur, which forms sulfuric acid. And you can't have that because you'll die. Your body will do anything to get back to balance or homeostasis. So what it does is it withdraws calcium out of your bones. It breaks down the bone and actually takes calcium out to neutralise the acid formation from consuming high animal protein. So that's another reason why you do not want too much animal protein in your diet. What you do want, though, is vegetable protein, because that does not do that damage. So as a summary, eat three portions of protein-rich foods a day for a man, two for a woman. Choose food vegetable sources of protein, which we've already gone through. Avoid animal protein. Um, and you'll be hunky-dory, won't you? <laughs> so let's move on to the next big one, which is glucose, because that's the sugar, the essential sugar that our brain by far prefers to run on a calm day, your br brain is eating, as a calm day, your brain is eating 40% of your glucose. So you get an idea of how glucose hungry your brain is. But, and this is the but, what we've got a tendency to do in the Western world is eat foods that give us a very quick glucose hit. Um, and that is very damaging because what your brain wants is a nice, steady, even supply throughout the day till you go to bed. And that's what we're not doing on the whole. So glucose imbalance, not glucose shortage, but an imbalance is probably one of the most common causes today in the UK of, um, how shall I put it, bad mood, anxiety, irritability. So this imbalance of glucose causes all the things, I'm sure you will recognise these in yourself, in your family, and um, you'll recognise it when, especially say you're travelling or something and maybe if you're a vegetarian you grab a chocolate bar to give you the quick hit, you get the quick hit and within half an hour you've gone whoomph and you start to get tense and, uh, and anxious. So an imbalance of glucose causes irritability, anxiety, tiredness, insomnia, excess sweating especially at night, low concentration, poor memory, excess thirst, depression, crying for no apparent reason, also digestive problems and can even cause blurred vision. Swansea University have done a fair bit of work on this and basically what they came to the conclusion that you should never skip breakfast, which I'm sure you've all heard. Um, how many of you do skip breakfast regularly? Okay. How many of you have breakfast regularly? Put it the other way around. Good. <laughs> And there have been a fair amount of studies on children skipping breakfast as well, um, showing that they lacked concentration and they were more irritable and found it harder to do the schoolwork, um, not surprisingly, when they were skipping breakfast. So that you do need this even um, supply of glucose <coughs> through the day. So what happens when you eat, um, let's say, a quick fix of glucose because you know that you're hungry and your brain is actually crying out for some energy source which as I said glucose is its preferred source so you're going to go for something probably that's very high sugar so if you eat say white bread with jam on it um, you know toast and jam if you ate a Mars bar or whatever or had a can of coke or any fizzy drink if you had um, a cake 
uh, so on and so forth, or pizza that's just made with a white base, things that are going to convert white spaghetti, white rice, things that are going to convert very quickly to the glucose and it's going to release the glucose very quickly. So say you have a, a chocolate bar and a fizzy drink, you're going to get this hit pretty damn quickly because the glucose is released very quickly into your bloodstream. But your system, as I said, it can't have that. It has to have balance. It has to have homeostasis. So what it does is it releases this massive amount of insulin, which you'll have all heard of, of course, because insulin goes around your body, your brain, and it knocks on the cell's doors, and it says, hey, I've got all this glucose. Let the glucose in, please. And if you're working, functioning normally, you're, you know, your cell will go, fine, you know, okay, open, receptor, in you come, glucose. Um, obviously, if you're going towards diabetes type 2, for example, then those cells start saying, not listening to insulin, don't want to know, you've done this too often, you got it wrong, I want to be treated better, go away. And it stops listening to the insulin, which then starts to be, can, of course, be a very dangerous disease, diabetes. It has to be treated because it will, of course, kill um, if it's not treated. So that's what happens when you eat that quick fix. You get this rush of insulin, and then, then what happens is you get every bit of glucose is grabbed out of your bloodstream because you've had this massive bam-wham hit. Wham-bam? <laughs> hit of glucose. Um, and that is not what you thrive on. What you need is this nice, steady release that goes on for hours. So, for example, for breakfast, if you're feeling a bit rough, the temptation when you wake up is to have white bread, say white toast with jam on it. Um, it might be to have black coffee with caffeine in it too. And that's to try and get the motivation going. And you'll get this quick release of glucose. And what I've just explained will happen. But then you'll get this down because it's taken every bit of glucose out of your bloodstream because of all that insulin being released. So what you need is a nice, slow, steady supply of insulin that's going around for the next four hours after your breakfast saying, hey, brain, come on, I've still got some, you know, come on, I can still do this. And then, it's, then you'll feel much, much more stable within yourself. And it really does affect your mood. And your mood affects how you see yourself and how you see the world. So an ideal breakfast, instead of that jam on toast, would be muesli or oat porridge um, topped with berries. Berries are exceptionally important food because they're so full of antioxidants and protective chemicals. But any fruit that's got a rich colour in it, because it's that colour that protects your health. So think of all the colours, the orange of a mango. Think of the bright yellow of a pineapple. Think of the dark, um, almost purple of a raspberry. Think of the bright red of a strawberry. And it's the, what's giving these fruits the colours that actually protects your health. So think in terms of rainbows all the time. So add the berries. It doesn't matter if they're frozen berries, because they're easier and cheaper to get. Tip them onto your muesli or whatever. Um, chop a banana, put that in, cinnamon instead of sugar, cinnamon sweetens it and cinnamon's very protective of health and in fact helps the insulin work properly. So sprinkle it, you can't overdose on cinnamon as much as you want on top of that breakfast. And then to top it all, the high protein, the flaxseed, ground flaxseed, it has to be ground and you can buy it ready ground from any health shop because if you eat it whole it comes out in your poo like it would in a bird for seed dispersal. You need it to be ground so that you're extracting the essential fatty acids from it. And that's a perfect breakfast. OK, just one example. So let's go on to essential fatty acids, EFAs. Now, 60% of your brain, if it was dried, is fat. So our brains are essentially made of fat. And you're replenishing that fat all through your life. So it's not like, you know, you give birth to a baby and they've got all those omega-3s and 6s in place, and that's it. No, 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 no. You know, you have to replenish all the way through to your death. So it's really important that you do eat omega-3s and 6s in your diet. So what's the clue of if you're not getting enough essential fatty acids? Well, this is pretty serious stuff on this list, actually. So if you're suffering from deficiency, it, you, can, you can suffer from anything from depression, depression sorry, to Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, uh, dyslexia, um, attention deficit disorder, extreme tiredness and loss of memory, and also it's hard to be as intelligent as you would be if you're low in those essential fatty acids. And you remember at the start I showed you that diagram where the actual receptors for all your messengers, the neurotransmitters, were actually sitting on a bed, a membrane that was made from these essential fatty acids.
Your eyes, also very much made from them. <coughs> also, these essential fatty acids form part of the actual myelin sheath. And this is the fatty layer that goes around and insulates all your nerve cells. So it, very, very, very important. It makes what are called prostaglandins. And these are like hormones, very quick acting though. And these relax your blood vessels and so lower your blood pressure. So that's why omega-3s are so important in heart disease. Um, they boost your immunity. Very important in decreasing inflammation. So in something like arthritis, for example, that's pro-inflammatory, I would prescribe to you a diet that was very rich in omega-3. They also help insulin work back to insulin and help balancing blood sugars. But in the brain, not only is the membrane made from them, so the structure, but they regulate the release and the performance of those messengers. So you're getting an idea now. They're called essential fatty acids because you do not manufacture them inside. You have to get them in your diet. So the best, by far, plant source of omega-3 fats is flaxseed. It's exceptionally high in omega-3. It's also known as linseed. You might have heard that instead. So what I just said was by ground flaxseed, so that you're getting the fats out. Or, of course, you can buy the oil. So the oil's already been extracted from the seed. If you do that, always keep the oil in the fridge because it goes rancid really, really easily and never, ever cook with it because it's totally unstable at heat and you destroy all the goodness. So how do you use it then? Well, well, when my kids were younger, in fact, what I used to do was put a teaspoon of flaxseed oil just on the meal that had been finished cooking, so you're not cooking with it. So the taste of the oil is just lost in that final food. And that's just habit. Just do it every evening meal. You could use it for salad dressings and so forth. I can't swallow it just as an oil. But that's just me. I just, bleh. Um, so I wouldn't use it like that myself. Flaxseed, ground flaxseed, I really enjoy. It's got a really, really nice taste. So I do use that on breakfast cereal every morning. We tend to have way too much omega-6 and nowhere near enough omega-3. So that's why I've been pushing flaxseed to you to balance it back up again, to have the omega-3. But if you have a really good diet and you're being really good, um, and you're doing, I'll give you a chart at the end actually, it's what you should eat each day, um, which is really good to put on your, you know, your fridge or something. If you're doing what it says in that, then you do need a source of omega-6, and that is these, so it's sunflower, sesame, hemp and rapeseed or oils, um, and nuts, especially pistachios and pecans and walnuts. Soya again, because soya is an exceptionally healthy food in my view. And the other thing to note as well is that actually what you, other things you eat can knock out the essential fatty acids. So for example, alcohol actually goes boom, pushes the good guys out of the way and replaces it with an inferior chemical. But saturated fats, the bad fats, do the same thing. They push the good fats out of the way. Ooh, like big bully boys. So where do you get most saturated fats? Well, mainly in dairy, hard cheese, butter, chocolate, ice cream. Um, meat, of course, is high saturated fat. Um, and do not think by eating chicken you're okay instead of red meat because today every chicken contains about a pint of fat, exceptionally fatty food. And a guy from London University has said he thinks that the awful um, rise in the consumption of chickens is one of the reasons our nation's becoming so obese. So it's just to note, it's not just about eating the good things, it's about getting the bad things out of your diet as well. That's what I'm getting at. This is just to say, to remind you, that some nutritionists bang on and on and on about eating fish for omega-3, and you do not need to do this. The fish actually get it from um, the plankton and the algae, and they make, from omega-3 or ALA, they make the two chemicals, EPA and DHA, which um, are in the fish. Uh, but you can manufacture EPA and DHA absolutely, totally fine as long as you're eating the omega-3 or the ALA. I hope that makes sense. And by the way, every fish in the ocean is now contaminated with mercury and dioxins, every single one. So how much do we need? Well, this was a bit meaningless, 200 to 400 milligrams of DHA and APA. <laughs> They're the chemicals that you make inside you from eating omega-3. Um, so let's put it into real terms. This is the important bit. It's one tablespoon of flaxseed oil or three tablespoons of the ground flaxseed makes way more than enough for the needs of a vegan 
to actually lower blood pressure or treat somebody who's got learning difficulties. So what I'd say was if you haven't got blood pressure and you haven't got learning difficulties, you don't need that much. You need about a teaspoon of flaxseed oil and about one to one and a half tablespoons of ground flax seeds every day. And that's enough. You're getting plenty um, to convert into the uh, chemicals that you need for everything that we've talked about. This was a study just to mention. It was interesting, though, because they measured um, omega-3 levels in vegans who ate nuts and seeds regularly uh, against the average American consuming meat and fish. A lot of meat and fish, which everybody says, you know, you've got to eat fish for omega-3. And in fact, the vegans had twice the level of omega-3. So I thought that would interest you. So eat seeds and nuts, especially flax, as we've mentioned before. Use cold-pressed oils, um, for example, flaxseed oil. Drizzle them on salads, as I mentioned. Keep the oils in the fridge and don't cook with them. Minimise fried foods and processed foods. Avoid meat and dairy. Um, and you can buy EPA and DHAs, which is what Omega-3 makes, as a supplement if you're worried about it. But I don't think you need to, personally, unless you've actually got, you know, as I say, a specific health problem. So that brings us on to phospholipids. Now, these are not talked about very much, but they are very, very important, actually, because they enhance your mood. They enhance your mental performance and they protect you against Alzheimer's and um, age-related memory decline. Again, they make the actual sheath that protects all the neurons in your body and brain. Crucially, they're used to make acetylcholine and that's the brain's memory neurotransmitter. So as you can see, uh, for memory, phospholipids are absolutely essential. They're used in thousands and thousands of um, chemical reactions that keep your brain healthy and balanced. And they also lower something called homocysteine, which you've probably all heard of because high homocysteine is bad for your heart. So choline is in one of the types of phospholipids um, and that actually makes the brain's memory neurotransmitter. So you need to be uh, making and consuming enough to ensure that your nerve cells um, are all absolutely healthy and that you are making enough acetylcholine so that your brain has its optimum memory, if you like. And a deficiency in choline is probably the single commonest cause of memory loss in the UK. <laughs> um, we make phospholipids, by the way, but you can get more. And the best source um, is soya beans, or if you actually want to take a supplement, you can buy soya lecithin, which is a very good source of phospholipids, and you just buy it, usually in a round sort of um, container in health food shops. You can buy it as granules, and again, it tastes absolutely fine, and you just sprinkle it on cereal or whatever. And I've just put in there, it doesn't make you fat, it actually helps you digest fats. So it's a positive thing to do if you feel that you need to do it. So my final group is the vitamins and minerals, and how they're kind of described is like, imagine that the main players like glucose um, and the amino acids, etc., are the main actors on the stage. The vitamins and minerals are like the crew behind the scenes making sure everything happens. And without them, everything just crumbles and falls apart. So they are very, very important indeed. So vitamins you can't manufacture internally. You've got to consume in your diet. And the best sources of vitamins... A, or as beta-carotene, and C and E are which group of foods? Of course, it's fresh fruit and vegetables. And they have the ACE triumvirate, the, um, the main antioxidants which protect your brain. And vitamin E specifically stops the fats in your brain from going rancid because fats literally do go rancid. The B group vitamins are things like the whole grain group um, and so forth. So what are the roles of the vitamins and minerals? Well, turning, crucially, turning glucose, the sugar that your brain likes, into the energy molecules, turning the amino acids from the protein into the messengers, as we discussed earlier, um, getting the omega-3s that you eat into the other chemicals, the more complex fats, and into the, the fast-acting hormones, turning the choline into the phospholipids and building the brain and nervous system up. So the B vitamins first, well, all of the B vitamins, all of them are vital to brain health. Um, and we need them because, well, 
Without them, we soon feel the effects as they're water soluble so that you're not um, storing them except B12, which you store in your liver. So basically, there's lots and lots of reasons why the vitamins are needed, and some of them I've mentioned here, like B6, 9, and 12. Um, are vital to forming the neurotransmitters. So they're the brain's messengers yet again. Um, and B6 is needed to make serotonin and so forth. Vitamin C, again, helps balance many of those messengers yet again. And has been used, especially in schizophrenia trials, for example, and has shown um, some very positive results. Calcium and magnesium, um, they, you probably remember this, but they relax... Um, and contract uh, muscle cells, for example. So I'll just get you to do just a little test on magnesium. If you turn to your neighbour and pull your tongue out at them and see, just see if you can hold your tongue still or whether it quivers and tell your neighbour whether their hot tongue is still or whether it quivers and I'll tell you why in a sec. You just do that. <laughs> so can you put your hands up if your tongue managed to stay still? And your hand it quivered. Because the reason I asked you to do that is because magnesium relaxes muscles. And if you haven't got enough magnesium, you can't do something like hold your tongue still because your body's not going to waste, a sh if there's a shortage, in keeping something like your tongue still. It's going to use it for the essential things. So, for example, magnesium is essential to making energy, and that has to be used for that. <laughs> So it's just an illustration. And also cramps, muscle cramps are an obvious sign as well, if you get that, of magnesium deficiency. So a lack of either magnesium or calcium makes you more edgy. It can make you nervous, irritable, aggressive. Um, magnesium in trials has helped children with autism and hyperactivity. And also you can take magnesium before you go to bed to help you sleep. It's got a relaxation role, in other words. Um, it's been used, magnesium, in um, trials on severely depressed patients and they improved significantly. They took supplements again uh, with each meal and at bedtime and it helped alleviate moodiness, anxiety, <coughs> hyperactivity, irritability, insomnia, even suicidal thoughts and lessened the abuse of drugs such as cocaine and alcohol. So it's just an illustration for you of how important these nutrients are to us. Magnesium may be the second most common deficiency after zinc, but exceptionally, exceptionally easy to find on a vegan diet because, as I said, it's part of chlorophyll, which makes the leaves green. <coughs> also very rich in nuts and seeds, by the way. Anxiety girl, able to jump to the worst conclusion in a single bound. How many people do you know like that? So zinc is the most common deficiency in terms of minerals, and yet it's the most crucial one for mental health. And low zinc is associated with very serious disorders like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, anorexia, delinquency, hyperactivity, autism, and poor memory. And we need more zinc if we're stressed out. Um, we have premenstrual tension, um, if we eat excess copper, if we are frequent alcohol drinkers, um, and so forth. Now zinc is in any seed food, so it's the growth of the plant again, think it like that. Um, seeds, nuts, pulses, and so forth. This is just a summary of some of the nutrients and the symptoms of deficiencies and the food sources for them. Just to give you a, an idea, really, that's what I'm stressing on you is that you do need a good whole food vegan diet. And that will provide everything, absolutely everything that you need. You need to eat, well, it says at least five, but I'm saying aim at eight to ten, actually. So really think about that. How are you going to get your fruit and vegetable uptake? You know, uh, it, how are you going to get your fruit and vegetable intake to go up? A lot of you weren't eating even five a day. So one way to do it, of course, is to, um, well, what I do with the family is chop fruits up, lots of different fruits, and give lots of fruit salads because people eat a lot more fruit that way. If it's chopped up small, it's a lot more appetizing for adults as well as kids. Uh, do you use fruits on breakfast cereal so you're immediately having at least two portions of fruit on the actual cereal before you've even started the day. Obviously, fruit as a snack is ideal with the protein food because the protein, those nuts, not just provides the amino acids for your brain health, but they slow the release of the sugars from the fruit. So you get this nice release from the snack through the day. So I'd give fruit with a nut as a, as a snack. Um, Obviously, it's fruit and vegetables so in the evening. Think how can you add more vegetables to your evening meals? Again, think rainbow. 
the orange of a carrot, the yellow of sweet corn, the dark green of broccoli. Think every day, how do I add a colour? So if you do a sandwich that's just, say, cheating meat on brown bread, how do you add colour? Dead easy, the dark green of rocket or the dark green of watercress, this grated carrot, the orange, um, some sweet corn on it, the yellow. Take you, what, one minute, two minutes to do that? And suddenly, the bright red of a tomato. You've got a rainbow on your, sal you know, on your sandwich and suddenly the nutrient value goes through the roof. Really easy, quick things to do. Finally, I just want to talk to you about alcohol. How many people drink alcohol? So that's practically everybody. Uh, just because I find this interesting, I've got a personal interest in this because I do like a glass of wine. <laughs> so I find the um, contradictory almost studies fascinating just from a scientific perspective. So it's true, omega th uh, so omega-3s are bumped out by alcohol. That's a negative thing, absolutely, obviously, because as you know now, we definitely need omega-3s. And you get lowered intelligence with high alcohol drinkers, and you get brain damage. You will all know this, as well as liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's true, you can put yourself at risk of certain cancers, more cancers, um, through, eating, sorry, through drinking high alcohol. But these are the interesting, that seem contradictory studies. Light drinkers have the healthiest brains. So they have, by that, less strokes, less dementia. The least part of, one part of the brain called the hippocampus um, shrinking was measured. So they had the least damage for that. The heavy drinkers had by far the most damage, which is what you would expect. And they had more strokes, more dementia, and of course more damage than those people who were, I always want to say celibate, and I don't mean celibate. What do I mean? What's the word? Teetotal, that's it. <laughs> I need more acetylcholine. <laughs> um, so, that's interesting, isn't it? That light to moderate drinkers had the healthiest brains. So this is interesting. Why? Well, it's not totally known why, but the theory is this, that when you consume alcohol, it promotes GABA, which I mentioned at the beginning. And GABA is the one that switches adrenaline off. So when you come home from work, maybe you've been in a traffic jam, maybe you're a bit stressed out, maybe your boss has given you a grilling that you thought was unfair, maybe you've just got too much work to do, maybe your kids are doing this, whatever. You know, there's a lot of adrenaline in your system and you drink a glass of wine or whatever alcohol it is and that promotes the GABA and the GABA says, hey, chill now, let's switch that adrenaline off and let's feel better. And you all recognise that feeling because that's probably exactly why you're reaching for alcohol because it most definitely has that effect and it's quite a pronounced effect as well. Um, and it's fairly instant, especially if you're hungry. And the other reason you're probably drinking alcohol when you get home from work is you've probably not had your nuts and fruit snack at 3pm and you're getting an instant glucose hit. So it's another reason why we can reach for alcohol because the release of sugar is so fantastically fast which is not necessarily a good thing. I'm just explaining it. But because we live such stressed out lives, it's thought that actually the promotion of GABA is more protective than having excess adrenaline. And so that is thought to be one of the reasons why just one to two glasses of wine, I'm talking, as soon as you go over and go into you know, more than light drinking, then you're in trouble. But if you can stick at the one to two glasses of wine, and by the way, in studies, the most powerful powerfully protective was Cabernet Sauvignon, so it's a red wine. And that's because the resveratrol, which is thought to be the thing in wine that protects your health, the resveratrol is in the skin and in the seeds. And that, of course, is got rid of for white wine, largely anyway. Whereas with red wine, that's kept. So you've got this, think about the colour of red wine. It almost looks good for you, doesn't it? You know, it's talking about the rainbows. Well, the resveratrol, is in very powerfully in the red wine. And for some reason, and it's thought to do with the fermentation, the making of the alcohol, but red grape juice does not have the same powerful effect. It has, it's good, but not anywhere near as powerful as red wine. So that's just, and it protects, it, for example, it protects against the formation of strokes. It protects against all kinds of diseases. But having said that, alcohol can promote cancers in some cases. So it's kind of like, you know, weighing all these things up, isn't it? Finally, I like this because it's stress is dessert spelled backwards. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that? Um, when we get stressed, we do actually 
cause part of the brain cells to shrivel up and die? And have you noticed that if you have sustained stress, your memory goes? Have any of you noticed that? You start to get scatty? Well, the good news is you do actually grow them back, but you need to get rid of the stress. It's not just about diet in that case, is it? But diet can certainly limit the impact of it. So that's it. That's all we got time for, folks. But I hope that um, basically we're coming back to what you need to eat every day. I hope now you can understand why a healthy whole food vegan diet is so positive for brain health and can promote good mood, less anxiety, less ir irritability, even if your life is too fast paced. Eating a good diet gives you the protection that you need to be able to cope and to give those around you what they need from you as well, as well as for yourself. So. Um, I hope that's um, giving you food for thought, literally. Thanks very much.